you have your copy of Scripture, if you'll turn to the book of Psalms, Psalm 111. You know, it's always difficult when we come to Thanksgiving and Christmas to, to really kind of approach it in a different way, to, to talk about it in a way that we haven't talked about it before. And I really want to hone in on Psalm 111 today because it is an amazing psalm. It reminds us exactly what we just sang, that it is our duty, it is our responsibility to praise the Lord forever. O come, let us adore him. You know, we, we talk about adoration, we talk about praise, we talk about giving thanks, but what does that really mean? What does that really look like? Is it just singing or is it more than that? Well, I, I really want us to see today that, that thanksgiving is really thanks living. That if we want to praise God forever, if we want to lift up his holy name, it really matters more what we say than it, it's more what we do. And I want you to read with me in Psalm 111 the, the reasons that the psalmist gives us to praise God forever. Psalm 111, verse 1. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart in the company of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. Splendid and majestic is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has made his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He has given food to those who fear him. He will remember his covenant forever. He has made known to his people the power of his works and giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are truth and justice. All his precepts are sure. They are upheld forever and ever. They are performed in truth and uprightness. He has sent redemption to his people. He's ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. This psalm was written sometime after the people were delivered out of Babylon. And the psalmist is looking back and he's saying, there's so many things that I have to be thankful for. You ever stop and think about that? I know this time of year is one of those times where we kind of slow down a little bit and we kind of take stock of our life and we begin to say, what am I thankful for? And sometimes maybe we don't feel like there is anything to be thankful for. That there's too much going on in the world. There's too much going on in my life. I really can't be thankful. I can't be grateful. I can't praise God because what has God done for me? Listen to what the psalmist says, and I love this. He says, praise the Lord. Now, I don't know if you see at the end of that, there's an exclamation point there. This is not a suggestion. It's a command. We are commanded in every situation, in every circumstance, in every season of life to praise the Lord. Now, we may feel sometimes a little weird about that. God, you haven't done what I've wanted you to do. You haven't shown up when I've needed you. You haven't done this or you haven't done that. And I've wanted this and you gave me that and I didn't really want that. And so sometimes it feels a little weird to say, well, we're going to praise God. Here's what the psalmist says through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. I want you to understand that it is God's will for you to praise him. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, it is God's will for us in Christ Jesus that we give thanks to him. Now, praise and thanksgiving are exactly the same thing. We are telling God that we recognize who he is and what he's done, and we want to praise him and thank him for being who he is and doing what he's done. And it's a command. Because the reality is there are so many things that God is doing, has done, and will be doing in our life that sometimes we can't even take stock of it. There's so much. It is God's will for us. The reason that God wants us to praise him, the reason that it's God's will for us to thank him is it reminds us of why we have all that we have. I read a quote one time, and I can't remember the author who, who wrote it, but basically he said that we have a problem in America it's that we're ungrateful, that we're not thankful, that we have all these beautiful, wonderful, amazing things, and yet we have nobody to thank for it. Why is that? Because we believe that we've done it all. And so when God commands us to praise him and when God commands us to thank him, we are reminded that what we have is a gift and a blessing from him. 
that everything that we have in our life comes generously and graciously from our King. And we should thank Him for it. Are you alive today? I hope so. If you're alive today, it's not because you woke yourself up. It's because God woke you up. You should thank him for that. Are you breathing right now? Are you sucking in oxygen and putting out carbon dioxide? If you are, thank God because he does that for you. Do you have the energy to go to work and earn money? Do you have a job that blesses you, that takes care of you? You didn't get that because you were smart. You didn't get that because you're talented. You got it because he is good. I want you to thank him. The reason that we have a thankfulness problem, the reason that we have a gratefulness problem is that we think that we have done it all. And so when we come to this command of praising God and thanking God, it reminds us that God has given us everything. And you know what? I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that I wasn't smart enough to find this church and put my resume in. It happened because God wanted me to do that. God blessed me by bringing me here. I'm thankful that I'm not handsome enough to get my wife, that God blessed me with her. And I know that all too well. Every time I look in the mirror, I say, the only reason I have Heather is because God is good, amen? (laughs) The reason I have my beautiful children is God bless me with them. Listen, he says to praise God and we should praise God for everything in our life because everything in our life, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father above. It would radically change the way we see things, it would radically change our perspective. We began to look at everything in our life as a gift and a blessing from God. Now, he puts a little caveat on that, not just to praise the Lord, because there's a way to do that that isn't good. But here's what he says, praise the Lord with all your heart. Nobody wants praises from somebody that their heart's not in it. You ever had that? (laughs) <laughs> this is generally happens in families where we have to get a sibling to praise another sibling, right? Oh, that was good. <laughs> You're awesome. <laughs> no heart, right? It takes all of the value out of it. Here's what he's saying. I want you to praise me with all of your heart because I want you to mean it. I want you to mean it. And when you do it with all your heart, you have to ask the question, Are you really thankful? Are you really thankful for what's happened in your life? Are you really thankful for the gifts that he's given you? Are you really thankful for the way that he's worked? If he is, then how natural is it to look at him and go, thank you. Thank you. You know, it's really a window to our heart praising God because if we're having trouble praising God, there's something going on in our heart. We're having trouble mustering up a feeling to say, God, I love you, and God, I'm so grateful to you, and God, you are amazing and wonderful. If there's something wrong, there's something wrong. He says, praise the Lord with all your heart. And then he says something that I first thought was strange, and then I feel like this is a wonderful gift that God has given us. He says, praise the Lord with all of God's people. Praise the Lord in the assembly and the company of the upright. I thought, that's strange. What what are you talking about? There's something amazing about being able to take something that has happened to you or something that's been given to you that is so overwhelming and sharing it with somebody else. It's almost like you get to relive the joy of that experience. We do it all the time, don't even think about it. We sit down and we talk about, man, I went to this restaurant last night, let me tell you how awesome it was. And you kind of relive that experience. I went to this game, let me tell you about that. I went to this place, let me tell you about it. God has created a place for us to be able to come to all the time and sit down with people who have the same experience as us to say, can I tell you what God has done for me? And they're gonna go, yes, and let me tell you what God has done for me. And we keep talking about it and we're energized and we're passionate and we're amazed at what God does. 
when we come together, one of the things that should be happening is fellowship, yes, and we do a great job at that. Loving people, yes. But one of the things that should be happening when we come together and we sit down with the people around us in this building, we should turn to each other and say, can I tell you what God did for me this week? I, I just, I've just got to tell you what God has spoken to me. I've got to tell you what God has done for me. I've got to tell you how God has worked in my life. And what should happen is the person sitting with you should say, amen, praise God, and let me tell you what he's done for me. That's better than any sermon. That's better than any song. And so God has created this family for us to come together of people who are commanded to praise him with all of our heart and we come together and it makes it more powerful and it makes it more intimate and it makes it more special when we can share with someone and they go, yes, me too. I want to encourage you today, before you leave this place, I want you to walk up to someone. I want you to look them in the eye and say, can I tell you what God has done for me? I just... I want to praise him. I just want to thank him. I just want to honor him. And I just want you to hear it. You're going to bless somebody's socks off. And then if somebody does that to you, what I want you to do in return is, can I tell you what God's done for me? Now, sometimes we may struggle to think about, well, what can I praise him for? Well, don't worry, the psalmist has taken all the guesswork out for you. Here's what he says. Great are the works of the Lord. Verse 2, great are the works of the Lord. They are to be studied by all who delight in them. In this passage, he uses very colorful words to talk about how God works in our life. He says, great, splendid, majestic, and wondrous. This is how he describes what God does in our life. And I want you to think about those words, great, splendid, majestic, and wondrous. Do you ever experience that? Do you ever experience God working in your life and you're just like, like your breath is taken away, you're just awe-inspired? Man, I hope so. If you haven't, come see me afterwards. And I want to share some ways that God's worked in my life where I can say it's great and it's splendid and it's majestic, and it's wondrous. If you're struggling to see how God has done that, I want to show you three specific ways that God has worked in our life, outside of the millions of other ways, but three specific ways. One is in creation. Psalm 19 tells us the heavens declare the glory of God. Day after day and night after night, they're speaking all over the world the truth of who God is. Romans 1 tells us that creation reveals God, his nature, his character, his power. You ever had a moment where you're standing in creation and you realize how big God is and how small you are? You ever had that? One of those moments that was great and splendid and majestic and wondrous for me was in 2001. Scheduled to go on a mission trip to Israel, and they started having bombings and terrorist terrorist attack in Israel, and we couldn't go. We had to go to Africa, and I was let down because I wanted to go to Israel. And we go to Africa, and we spend uh, 13 days in Africa, and and it just hit me one night. I was sleeping on the roof of the place that we were in because it was much cooler up there than it was in the house. Sleeping on the roof, and as I look up, I saw nothing but stars. And I want you to know I'd never seen this amount of stars before. It felt like I was swimming in a pool of stars. And in that moment, it was as if God reached down and touched my heart and said, I am here and I love you. And the trip was wonderful, but that moment, that moment helped me recognize how big God is and how small I am, and yet he still knows me. God has created this beautiful, unique, amazing, overwhelming universe. And in the midst of all the stars and the planets, he's created this one special place called Earth. And on this one special place, he's created a special people called humanity. And he's placed humanity on this planet in his image. You ever just stop and recognize that you are unique, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. 
I mean, creation is awesome, but humanity is even better. We are the crowning achievement of God's creation because we are made in his very image. Great are his works. Splendid are his works. Majestic are his works. Wondrous are his works. Revelation. Have you ever thought what it would be like to live in such a beautiful, unique place and be beautiful and unique creatures and never have God speak to you? How sad that would be. But God has spoken to us. He's written it in the stars. He's written it in all creation. So we get it out there, but not not just out there. God has written it in our heart. And then God has spoken to us through his prophets and through his word and through his son. Think about that. Think about how great, how splendid, how majestic, how wondrous it is that the God of the universe, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords, the Prince of glory has spoken to you, has revealed himself to you. The greatest work that God could have ever done that we would never imagine that he would do is redemption. The work of redemption where God became a man. And God lived a sinless and perfect life, not because he had to, but because we can't. That God filled up all the works of righteousness that needed to be done, not for him, but for us. And God took our place. And God paid our debt. And God drank down the wrath that he had against our sin. And God drank down all of death and hell. He drank it all down so there's nothing left for any of us. He paid it all. God has demonstrated his love for you. That while you were a sinner, Christ died for you. I think great needs to be applied to that. I think splendid, majestic, wondrous. See, here's the thing. If you're struggling to find something to praise God for, start there. It's amazing how quick it comes when you just look out into the world and say, God, I thank you for the uniqueness and the majesty and the glory of creation. I thank you for places like the Grand Canyon. I thank you for places like Africa. I thank you for all these beautiful, wonderful reminders of who you are. God, I thank you that you have spoken to us. You didn't leave us in the dark. You've spoken to us and you've revealed yourself to us and you've shown us what it is that you want us to do. And God, I praise you that you didn't leave us in our sin, but you came and you rescued us in the most intimate, personal way possible. Now, I agree with this phrase that the psalmist says in verse 2. He says, great are the works of the Lord, and I say amen. And then he says, they are to be studied by all who delight in them. I agree with that. I think one of the reasons that we struggle with gratefulness and thankfulness is that we forget to study the things that God has done in this world and for us. His works are to be studied by all who delight in him. What does that mean? It means that we take time to look at what God is doing and we ask two questions. What is God, what is God doing right now? What does it say about him? What does it say about him that he's created in the way he's created? What does it say about him that he's revealed himself to us in this way? What does it say about him that he's revealed himself in this way and redeemed us in this way? What does it say about him? And then what does it say about us? You you start to study his works and you start to look at them and you begin to find out that God is greater, stronger, more powerful than we could ever imagine. In fact, Paul says uh, that, that God is able to do exceedingly above and beyond all that we can think or imagine. We don't always see it that way, do we? We don't always feel that way, do we? It's because we're not studying who he is and we're not studying what he does. If you look 
from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation, if you look at the history of the world, if you look at the history of your life, God's actions in your life can only point to one direction and only point to one conclusion, that he is good and that he is gracious and that he is kind and that he is patient and he wants to bless you and not to harm you. Paul says in Romans chapter two, it is the kindness of the Lord, the kindness of God that leads to repentance. Isn't it funny that we focus on the small amount of times that God brought judgment and we overlook the hundreds of millions of times where God brought grace and kindness and slowness to anger. See, if we really study God's works, if we really study God's works, we begin to understand who he is. It's kind of like what we talked about a couple of weeks ago when Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you ever wonder what God's going to do, if you ever wonder how God's going to act, just study his works. And I tell you, what you're going to find, the common thread through all of that is that God delivers and God doesn't lie and God keeps his promises and God does what he says he's going to do over and over and over and over again. And so if you're struggling to be grateful, if you're struggling to be thankful, study his works and you'll see who he is. Splendid and majestic is his work and his righteousness endures forever. He has made his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. Not only are his works to be studied, but his works should be memorials in our life that bring us hope. His works should be remembered. If you're familiar with your Old Testament, God just consistently over and over again after something major happened in the life of a person or the life of his people, what would he tell them to do? Stop and make a memorial. Stop, put up some stones. Stop, remember this place, set up an altar. Stop, do this so that you can in later generations remember when they, when they come and they say, why are the stones stacked this way? You can say, God did this. You know, we, we set up memorials in our life all the time. One of the memorials that we set up are graves. We have a place to go back to, to say, this is my parents, this is my spouse, this is my children, and we remember. We set up war memorials to remember either the great tragedy or the great victory. And so here's what God wants you to do in your life for you to be thankful and for you to be grateful is to set up memorials. To set up memorials in your life to say in this moment, God did this. We set up memorials because we don't want to forget. And it's not the memorial that's important, it's the work that was done. I want to challenge you today to think about some memorials in your life. November of 1993 is a memorial for me. That was the night that I finally broke out of legalism. I finally stopped pretending and I got on my face and I asked Jesus to forgive me of my sins and he made me new and he changed me forever. I stopped playing church. I stopped pretending. I remember in 2005, tons of moments where the Lord spoke to me after such deep loss in my life. I could go on and on and on, but there are these moments that God has shown up in my life and God has shown up in your life and you need to hold those on to, to yourself as memorials. Because life gets tough and things seem dark and our flesh creeps in and says, God isn't going to show up this time. God isn't going to help this time. God can't deal with what is happening right now. And that's when a memorial would be great to look back and go, well, look, if God can handle that, he can definitely handle this. If God can get me through that, he can get me through this. I want you to think. 
What are some memorials in your life where God has acted and God has moved or God has spoken or God has ministered to you in some way that you can look back on and say, you know what? I know what's going on in my life right now, but God did this and I know he'll do it again. Do you understand the the entire Old Testament is just a memorial? In 1 Corinthians, we are told by Paul, these things have been written to you so that you may not sin so that you don't act like these people, that you remember who God is, you remember what God has done, and because of that, you can live in victory and hope and grace. Now, his works are memorials that should bring us hope. But here's the memorial that he wants us to remember. Listen to what it says. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. Now look, the Holy Spirit could have written anything about God that he wanted. He chose this. He didn't say swift to judgment. He didn't say destroying his enemies. He didn't say hating sin. He didn't say all the things that we like to put before this. What did he say? The Lord is gracious and compassionate. Here's what you need to hear today. All of God's work in your life are based on and grace. Every work that comes to you, everything that comes to you comes through God's grace before it comes to you. How can you say that? I don't. He did. His works are splendid. They're majestic. They're amazing. They're wonderful. And they're based in grace. You go back to the Garden of Eden Adam and Eve have sinned. They've hidden from God. God has brought judgment to them. And in his judgment, he brings grace. He covers them to cover their sin. And then he puts them outside of the garden. And we say, that's awful and terrible. He's removing them from his presence. But he says he does it because of grace. He doesn't want them eating from the tree of life and living forever in their sin. It's grace. We look at another time where Jesus is hanging on the cross. He's literally dying for the world. And we say, how is that graceful? It's graceful because he's the only one that can die for our sin and do anything about it. So God puts on him what he can't put on us. All of God's works in our life are based in grace. And all of God's works in our life are infinitely compassionate. We may not understand why they're there. We may not understand why we're going through the things we're going through. We may not understand why they're lasting as long as they have. But we are told in the book of Job that God will not allow anything to come that doesn't pass through his compassionate hands first. And God is always tempering the things that come into our life with his grace and his compassion. We never get the full force. And listen, I'm not trying to belittle struggles. I'm not trying to belittle problems or things. What I'm saying is this, is that we can be grateful and we can be thankful and we can look at God and say, God, I know this could be much worse, but you're not allowing it to be so. I know that this would go on much longer, but you're not allowing it to be so. I know that this could end really badly for me, but you're in the one that's in control and you are kind and you are loving and you are compassionate and you have my best at heart. His work should be memorials. And within his works, he provides what we need when we need it the most. Now, this may seem weird, but look at verse 5. He says, he has given us food. He has given food to those who fear him. He will remember his covenant forever. Why? Why mention food? Why mention food in the midst of creation and revelation and redemption and deliverance? Why mention food? Because if God cares that you eat, and God cares that you have food enough, which is so small in the scheme of things, right? 
If God cares about something so seemingly insignificant, what does it mean about the stuff that is huge in our life? What do you think he thinks about that? If God has feeding you on his list of daily chores that he needs to do to provide for us and care for us, what do you think he's going to do with cancer? And unemployment and famine and disease and fear and war. I remember one time someone and I don't really think they meant it this way, but it just, it struck me because it came across this way that prayer should be about big things because that's what God's concerned with. And yet the psalmist and yet Jesus say totally different. That God is intimately involved in our lives and he intimately cares about the smallest little thing. We get ourselves in trouble when we convince ourselves that God is only concerned with the big things in our life. Because what that tells us is we have the responsibility to deal with the little things and God says, no, you don't. I deal with it all. He provides what we need when we need it the most. He shows his power by unleashing his truth and justice. He has made known to his people the power of his works and giving them the heritage of the nations, the works of his hands are truth and justice. These are the things that we really like to hear. These are the things that we really want to pray. And these are the things that are really true. God shows his power by unleashing his truth and justice into the world. Another theme, another thread, another part of the story that we see throughout the Old Testament is that God will not let evil prevail. God will not allow suffering to prevail. He will not allow war to prevail. He will not allow all these things. And so there are times when we say, God, what are you doing? And where are you? And when? And why? And how? And that's when we need to remember that God's going to unleash his truth and his justice. He always has, and he always will. One of the things that I love about this, God unleashes his power and his truth and justice in the world, and there's nothing that can stop it. Not even the nation's. We get so anxious and we get so worried and we get so upset about what our nations are doing. Can I just tell you something that helps me sleep at night? There is no nation that can stand against our king. None. And I don't care what crazy plan some guy, you know, the other side of the world is concocting and trying to come up with. He can't thwart God's plan. He can't stop God's plan and he can't do anything that's not in God's plan. Rest easy. Rest easy. Because your king is greater than the nations. And what he wants to do is unleash his truth and justice in this world. And he's going to bring an end to sin. He's going to bring an end to suffering. He's going to bring an end to sickness and an end to war and an end to oppression and all these things. And nothing and no one can stop him. He fulfills all of his promises. All his precepts are sure. They're upheld forever and ever. They are performed in truth and uprightness. You ever heard the verse that says, all of God's promises in Christ are yes and amen? You ever heard that? I would encourage you to go look it up. Did you you hear what it says? All of God's promises in Christ are yes and amen. Amen. What that means is all of God's promises are yes, yes, I'm going to do them. Yes, they're going to happen. Yes, it's going to be exactly the way that I say it. And they're amen. Very rarely I say it's true. Here's what he's saying. Yes, you're going to have it. And it's true. Nothing's going to stop it. God fulfills all of his promises. God has never once lied There's never been a moment when God has spoken something to someone and it was a lie. Ever. God has never once been confused. 
I don't know about you, but I get confused a lot. What I should say, what I should do, where I should go, how I should handle things. And there's times after I've said something that's come out of my mouth, and as it jumps out of my mouth and it's into the air, I'm like, oops, I shouldn't have said that. I was confused. I was confused by the facts. I was confused by the lack of facts. There's never been a moment where God's been confused. There's never been a moment where God has had to say, oops. God has, God is, and God always will fulfill his promises. One of the beautiful things that we can be thankful for and have a memorial of is Christmas. You may not have thought about it this way, but Christmas is a promise of God fulfilled. If you have a hard time understanding God's promises and how they get fulfilled, just look at Christmas because the Messiah has come. The Savior has been given. Promise fulfilled. And that's the only one promise you really need to hold on to. Because in that one promise, all the other promises are made real. He delivers his people. He has sent redemption to his people. He has ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. Told you this was written sometime after the people came out of captivity in Babylon. Can you imagine a a more deep memorial than to look back and remember we were once in slavery and now we're free? Well, you should. You should know what that feels like. If you've met Jesus Christ and you've asked him to come and live in your life, you know exactly what that means because once you were in darkness, once you were dead in sin, once you were covered by the debt of your sin, and now you are alive in Jesus, clean and clear and full of the Holy Spirit. I once was lost, but now I'm found. He delivers his people. God has, God is, and God always will deliver you. If you are caught in a situation right now and you don't know how to get get out of it and you don't think that God's going to be able to deliver you, can you just go back to the moment when God brought you from darkness into light, from death into life? Listen, there are times when I just feel like, man, I have, I have blown my life up. I've messed it up so bad. And then I go back to that memorial. I couldn't be more messed up than I was then. And God saved me. And God changed me. And God restored my life and he can do it again. Now, I told you at the beginning of this that thanksgiving is thanks living. How should our life change? How should our life change now that we've heard these wonderful things that we can praise God for and be thankful for? I think one way that our life should change is this. You make the commitment and you say, I will develop an attitude of gratitude for all the things that he has done. I don't know about you, it saps my strength. It takes my joy to be around people sometimes. Because what it seems to be is now that now we are a bunch of negative Nellies. We're just a bunch of party pooper coopers, right? We just walk around and all we can talk about is how bad everything is. I don't like this and I don't like that and I don't want this and I don't want that. Hey, dear one, can I just say this? For your health and the health of everybody else in the world, develop an attitude of gratitude. You have a billion things more to be grateful for and thankful for than anything that could be negative. Seriously. And I just, I want to be as super honest as I can. Your health will dramatically change when you stop being negative. And the health of everybody around you. It'll be crazy. People will be able to get off blood pressure medicine if you will start being positive. 
Develop an attitude of gratitude. Why? Haven't I given you enough reasons just from this passage to be grateful and thankful? Hasn't God done enough in your life to be grateful and thankful? Thanksgiving is thanks living, and because of that I'm committing to, I will praise God for all the ways that he works in my life. I've challenged you to do that today. I want to be practical. I want to be applicable. If you want to take this seriously, walk up to someone and say, can I tell you what God has done for me? And here's the crazy thing. I've saved this till now. I want to tell you the secret of what happens with praise and thanksgiving. When you start verbalizing your praise and thanksgiving to other people, guess what starts to happen in your life? All those moments before where you couldn't see God working, all of a sudden, he's working everywhere. What changed? Is it that because you were praising him and thanking him, God decided to work a little bit harder in your life? No. God's always at work. It's just that as you start recognizing it and you start thanking him for it, all of a sudden, you start seeing all these other places where God was working, and you're like, wow, I didn't know that. Thanksgiving is thanks living. I commit that I will remember all the times he's delivered me when I'm scared. You want to deal with fear in your life? You want to deal with that feeling of being alone? You want to deal with that feeling of being left out? All you need to start doing is rehearsing all the times where God has shown up where God has delivered, where God has cared, where God has, you know, shown you kindness and compassion. And guess what starts to happen? Your fear has to run. Fear cannot stand in the presence of Jesus. Despair cannot stand in the presence of Jesus. I commit that when I'm scared, I'm not going to look at the storm I'm not going to listen to the report. I'm going to start reciting all the times that God has worked in my life. And remember, if he did it before, he'll do it again. Thanksgiving is thanks living. I commit that I will trust in his promises. I commit that I will trust in his promises and I recognize that I will never be let down. I'll never be let down. Thanksgiving is thanks living. And I commit that I will live in victory because of his deliverance. God has already given you redemption. God has already given you freedom in Christ. It is your responsibility to live in it. And the way you live in it is by resting in what he's done. You don't have to fight for victory. You fight from victory. Thanksgiving is thanks living. God has given you an opportunity today to put feet to what you say you believe. You can leave completely different than you came in. You just got to trust in who God is. Look at the work that he's done. Remember what it says? Look at his work. What does it say about him? Here's what it says. God is way more willing to set us free than we are to be free. Thanksgiving is thanks living. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time to gather as your people and recite all the ways that you have worked in our lives. To thank you for the blessings that you've given us, to thank you for the promises that never fail, to thank you for the deliverance that you have given and continue to give and will give. May we today trust you and step out in faith and put down in our life a memorial. Today is the day 
when I said yes. Today is the day when I got free. Today is the day when my fear went away. Today is the day when my sin is gone. Today is the day when my shame has been taken care of. Today is the day that I find hope. And we can look back on it for the rest of our lives. Help us today to nail down a memorial so that we can praise you and we can thank you for what you do in our life. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, my name is Gabby Bethencourt. Thank you so much for joining us on our live stream today. If you have any questions about what we have going on here at Central, please make sure to check out our website. We have everything listed on there. And if you feel led to make a decision based on what you heard today, please make sure to message us. We would love to connect with you.